Welcome, everybody. My name is Nina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Library. With me is John Garrigan, the head of teen services at the Framingham Library, our partners in crime or horror, as you might want to say. Um, this has not been a horrifying experience, so that's been great. Um, so um, <laughs> she speak before, so I'm, I'm worried. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a quick thank you to the friends of the Ashland Library who have supported all of our programming. And if you've been on our calendar, you know we're pretty stellar. Um, also, obviously, Framingham. And as you know, when you walk through our booksellers, Aesop's Fables out of um, Holliston, and they have books from all of our authors for sale and signing. <laughs> okay. So we are recording this session, or trying to, so we will send the recording link out to everybody who registered. And um, we're not really sure about a Q&A yet. If you have a burning question, raise your hand. I might call on you. <laughs> if I have lots of burning questions, I may not, because they all of our authors will also be in discussion with you and each other later in the afternoon as well. So you'll have lots of opportunity to engage with them both here um, at their tables and um, in the small discussion groups. So without further ado, we're just going to start. And I'm horrible in with introductions. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say, Eric, please tell Wait, I will do one thing. We have Eric Nunali, Paul Tremblay, Eric LaRocca, Kayla Cottingham, Hillary Monahan, and Christopher Golden with us today. And it is such an amazing lineup. I've been excited for months about this. So I'm going to, again, terrible with introductions. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric and say, tell us a little bit about yourself and your latest book or the book you most want to talk about. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Eric Nunnally. Most people get that wrong, but it's, it's Nunnally. <laughs> um, I have written a couple novels and, and multiple short stories. Um, currently, uh, Blood for the Sun and All the Dead Men are my two novels that are currently in print. And uh, The Bad Book and... Um, Giving the Devil His Due are probably the two anthologies that I think are the most recent and have some of the best work in them. Hi, uh, I'm Paul Tremblay, uh, novelist and short stories. My most recent novel is called The Paul Bearers Club, uh, which is sort of presented as like a faux memoir autobiography with maybe vampire. Um, <laughs> and you know, my novel, The Cabinet at the End of the World, is currently in theaters as Knock at the Cabin. Uh, the book is always better, I say humbly. <laughs> um, I'm Eric Laraca. I'm the author of Things I've Gotten Here Since We Last Spoke. Um, my upcoming short story collection, The Trees Grew Because I Bled There, is a collection of eight dark um, fiction tales coming out through Titan, March 7th. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kayla Cottingham and I am the author of My Year's Darkest, which came out about 11 months ago. Um, and then two months from now in April, I have a second book coming out called This Delicious Death, um, formerly titled Hot Cool Summer, um, <laughs> which is very much the vibe. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hilary Monahan. I'm also Eva Darrows. I'm also Theta the Sounds. So I'm a little confused. Uh, yes. My uh, a novel that I'm here to see out there is Mary the Summoning, um, which is a YA horror about Bloody Mary because she scared the piss out of me. <laughs> um, my next novel will be a uh, YA horror as well. And I did the origin story of Miss Havisham. Mm -hmm. And that'll be out through Random House. Um, <laughs> So I have no title because I suck at that. So. <laughs> you know, we reached the point now where full sentences as titles and figuring <laughs> horror seem to be all the rage. Thanks, Arthur, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Yes. <laughs> is kind of gay, but also not kind of gay. Oh, people die. <laughs> That's better than, well, I was going to suggest you call it, I have no, no title because I suck at that. No, I don't. <laughs> Um, I'm Christopher Golden. Um, my latest novel is All Hallows, uh, which is a 1980s Halloween night uh, horror, I don't know, uh, suburban, <laughs> suburban, <laughs> suburban horror drama. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, they finally just announced, I've talked about it, that I'm writing a new Hellboy film, The Crooked Man. Um, and uh, and what I have announced anywhere is I just finished a new novel 
days ago, and um, I haven't announced the title anywhere, but it's called The House of Last Resort. Yeah. Um, I stole that title from Bracken. Chris, <laughs> <laughs> so. hold on to the, it's yours now. Mike, yeah. <laughs> because um, although I wanted to call this uh, panel discussion outtakes and bloopers, Chris wouldn't let me. <laughs> so he decided, or we decided, that it should be called Bright Side, the healing comfort of reading and writing dark fiction. You're surprised. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'd like for you to start, if you don't mind, about what about that topic kind of appealed to you. Um, <clears throat> boy, we're going to go, you, you said bright side, but we're going to go dark real quick, I think. Yeah. Um, that's what we do. That's what uh, I'm here for. Uh, you know, two points that I think we'll probably spend a lot of time talking about. The first is that um, I always say that uh, there's a song by Ben over the Rhine called All My Favorite People Are Broken. Um, and that's true. All my favorite people are broken. And I think that um, so many people that I know in the horror community are broken in some way. Um, but horror in and of itself, I do feel is comforting, is healing, is it, it, it makes you go through something. And when you're when you close the book at the end or when you leave the movie theater. You you get to exhale and you've and you've also shared some time with people who also have been through some shit. Um, and I would say that I've been waiting my entire career. I my first novel came out in 1994, which was basically at the very end of what's considered the crash of the horror genre sales wise. The popularity of the horror genre was huge in the 1980s and in the very early 1990s when. It went just plummet it down. And uh, basically, I've been waiting that whole time for the period that we're in now, which is for th almost 30 years, people have been saying, well, horror is coming back, horror is coming back. I see horror coming back. <laughs> it's been like, it's like Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown. <laughs> it just hasn't happened. And I really feel like um, the world is a dark place now. Um, you know, post MAGA while well, we're in it and, and post COVID while well, we're in it. Um, but I feel like partly because of the pandemic, um, people need what I consider the healing power of horror. People need to, we have darkness going on, but we can share that with other people. And the last thing I'll say on this topic for the moment is I spoke to a good friend of mine yesterday and he's a little younger than I am. Uh, so his kids are younger and his parents are younger than my uh, my wife's parents. Both of my parents are gone. And um, he works at home and we were talking about all these various things. And he said, no, I said, I'm, I don't want to stick my nose. And he said, no, I love talking to you about this stuff because it reminds me that it's not just me. That it's like, you know, he's dealing with issues with his kids because they're home all the time and, and issues with his mom because she's starting to sort of fade. And it's and I think that's what horror does for all of us, right? It's like, okay, even though it's all fiction, it's all monsters and all that stuff, um, I really do feel like at the end of the day, horror is good for you. especially, I would like to ask about the YA aspect of this question because you both write YA. I, I'm not completely sure if anybody else says that you specifically, I know, do. So I was hoping you would also respond to this part of it. Gen Z is wired. <laughs> Every single day, they get up and they turn on their little light box and they are inundated with a barrage of information and about 96% of it is total bullshit. And it's scary. And they are too young in general to be able to yet move the meter. So they're a victim of the circumstance. What YA horror does, um, is I think it looks at kids that are going through not only hormonal shifts, life changes, major decisions that they're making that could impact the next 60 years of their lives in ways that they can't even imagine. And it gives them a way to channel it because I mean, that entire period of time, that entire time in your life is about what control you do have, what control you don't have, being mad about what you don't, what control you don't have. So if you wake up and you're, you're that's that barrage of, bullshit uh this is a way to engage with trauma in a controlled way so like if you're you know i mean if you're a queer teenager 
you hear it on the news and you see that there are 216 anti-trans bills that are out there right now mm -hmm. and you don't feel like there's anything you as a 16 year old can do about that yeah it, it's got to go somewhere that those feelings have to go somewhere and um that's i think where YA horror comes in is is it's the the, the lifeline the, the pipeline also in a lot of ways i mean one of the novels I wrote called The Hollow Girl is literally a revenge narrative because I am petty. <laughs> and I'm not going to pretend that pettiness does not fuel 50% of my horror for any <laughs> I am angry. And if you have madness, if you have I any mean, madness, take it in any way you want. But if you have anger in your life, this is a way that you can do it. And it's not a felony. <laughs> It's true. When a monkey can stab someone for free with an animal. That's where you were. Exactly. Yeah. You don't need an alibi. <laughs> so I write pretty much exclusively for teenagers. Um, and a lot of my books are about both the queer experience and about um and there's like romance, there's uh very spooky monsters and so on and so forth. And a lot of it, when I come to a book, I think one of the first things is what about myself am I going to put into this? Because I find that writing horror is really cathartic for working through, you know, experiences that you've had. And so with my first book, it was very much the horror of coming out. Um, it was the first time I had written um, a sort of sapphic romance. And it was really freeing for me to be like, this is a narrative where the gay girls win in the end. And this isn't one where it's not a bear. Well, I mean, okay, the main character dies in chapter one, but she gets better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she comes back a little weird, but she's all right. <laughs> she still gets to go. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's trying to tell these triumphant stories about queer teens who win at the end. And I want to make sure that because I didn't have those narratives when I was a teenager. There was a lot of like, if there was a lesbian in a story, she was dead by the end. If, and so it's like, I want to write stories where queerness is like a thing that empowers the characters. It's something that gives them something that nobody, well, not nobody, but a lot of people don't have. Um, and so I found that that was something that was really important for me to work through writing my first book. And then my second book is very much my COVID book, um, where it's about a, a global pandemic, but it turns people into flesh eating ghouls instead of, you know, people with long COVID. Um, and that was very much me being like, so we've dealt with this big collective trauma, right? And we've all been changed by it. So how does that translate into how we move on with our lives, um, having been through this huge cataclysmic change. Um, and sometimes you just want to party and go to a music festival, but then you accidentally like cannibalize a boy and you're like, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very much like, I always pick a, a different thing to, it's like my personal therapy that all of you get to enjoy. <laughs> so that's my approach to horror. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my approach to horror and why it appeals to me, um, just to echo, you know, what Hillary and uh, Chris were saying, was that it is like super cathartic, um, you know, to be a queer person living in 2023, it's horrifying, you know, there are so many bills that are being passed against us, and uh, it feels I feel like I'm like not in control of really anything anymore. And that's what really terrifies me. Um, so I like to write about very bleak situations in queer people's lives. And I find that very cathartic. Um, you know, I, I feel as though um, horror has the potential to really uh, open up dialogues and really uh, be that that avenue that you can go to and see you see someone at their worst you see someone go through the madness and their descent down and you're you're safe watching it mm -hmm. you know experiencing it 
um, that to me is what's really helped a lot of my anxiety over the past, like, my whole life. So, <laughs> um, that's, that's really where I come at it from uh, when writing horror. Uh, great answers, everybody. And I really appreciated that Chris pointed out how old he was. <laughs> Did I say that? Well, you first book in 94 and people didn't matter. Wow. No, great answers. I mean, the to me, the cool part, or one of the coolest parts about R is there's no one way to do it, and there are so many ways to go about it, and everyone likes it for a different reason, uh, or it speaks to them for a different reason. Um you know, it's funny, I, I mean, since it hasn't come up, like it was sort of like in the panel discussion, like it seems to be online, like a lot of discussion of horror with heart, um, which I don't know, makes uh, my inner horror nerd kind of like, Ugh. I don't know, because I, I, you know, I want Eric's stuff is bleak as shit. And that's <laughs> um, no, right. I like horror with heart. I just don't want it all to be horror with heart. Like, I, I think there's a different way that, that some of us connect with it. Um, you know, which is fine. Um, you know, and partly I bring that up because, you know, talking to producers, uh, Hollywood producers, you know, somewhat recently they tell me, oh, we all want horror now because it's so hot, right? Quote, unquote, hot. It's like, but, you know, I've had producers say to me, we want horror, but it can't be too grim and it has to have a happy ending. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so they want a romance. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, for me, what it comes back to, I mean, it's essentially saying a lot of the similar things that, you know, the other panelists have said, but, um, and if I'm, if I'm mispronouncing this, uh, his first name, please forgive me, but, uh, you know, a brilliant Japanese writer, Kazuo Ishiguro, mm -hmm. um, he talked with his most recent book recently about for him, like he boiled down like the communication between writer and reader as the magic part is, oh, you feel that way too. Uh, and so, uh, Horror doesn't comfort me. I mean, maybe it does, but the comfort that I get is like, oh, this creator, the, you know, the filmmaker or the, the the book writer, sees the world the same way I do. He sees that there's something terribly wrong, and I find that hopeful. Even though like it's bleak as hell on the screen or on the page, like nothing gets resolved. People don't win because <laughs> everybody loses in the end eventually. You know, sorry, <laughs> but but that the reveal of that sort of horrific truth, I find comfort. I find hope in that. That like. Even with that in mind, we're still going to say, you know, we're still going to write stories. We're still going to share with each other. That that's the hope I I take out from horror, even sort of at its weakest. Yeah, I realize I very stupidly didn't uh, like briefly mention what <laughs> the, the two novels that I have are about, and it's about a, a a werewolf who lived a long time and is losing his memory in order to keep his memory intact. Searches for Murdered or Missing Children. So it's the first two books in a three-part series, um, which leads directly into what it is that, you know, my, my approach to, to uh, horror in particular. Um, when I was growing up, the, you know, I really enjoyed a lot of the pulpy adventure stories, which had a significant amount of horrific elements in it. And like the further back you go, the more murderous our heroes were, or, yeah. you know, the heroes that were depicted were. And at the end of those stories, they would pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and off on another adventure. Um, and over time, uh, you know, I started to be uh, more interested in, well, what, what happens after that? And the, the degradation of self that happens over time, especially when you're dealing with horrific elements, and um, how that tied into real life like this is how people go through life you know as you get older people around you get older there's accidents you know, particular traumas you know some more severe some not and they affect you and change you over time um, but i always really enjoyed the escapist aspect of horror thrillers in particular so something uh, where someone i feel like a lot of horror a lot of what we just consider horror is um, people finding themselves in way over their head in situations that were completely unexpected. And there's the type of person that is just drowning in that. And then there's the type of person who finds something within themselves to push forward, um, to 
succeed in some way, but come out of that changed. And I, I've just always enjoyed being able to see that type of story more often than live it, <laughs> because I, I read a lot of um, uh, like socio socio political historical work, and I find nothing more horrifying than than what we've actually done to each other over the years. And um, getting away from that, like knowing all of this that stuff, and being able to get away from it with fiction just feels a lot better. Yeah, I, I want to um, uh, respond in a way to what Paul said. Do, do I need this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm certain, um, which is never the case. I remember being a kid in horror, but so, uh, you know, uh, I'm 55. So am I. Oh, yeah, but, Maybe we should go down the line. Pretty, yes. <laughs> you know, you can you can still do a lot of push-ups. I'm just. <laughs> So it's interesting to me, Paul, that you feel like the, uh, you know, you're you're sort of raging against the, the idea of horror with heart not raging. I, no, I don't have I raging. Don't all to be that no, but what I'm saying is like that, that what I find interesting is I take heart from the horror that you write. I find the characters full of it and I find the narratives full of it. So even though the- Full of- yeah. Heart. Heart. <laughs> oh, okay. and, I, and I I find it interesting that that's really what I'm what I'm talking about, right? Is that that you you recognize the shared experience in other people's horror and terror and pain and and but more in their struggle, in their willingness to stand up and fight and try to figure it all out, even if they fail at the end. And when things go horribly wrong, like if you haven't read The Cabin at the End of the World, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but, you know, Paul doesn't, it's called The Cabin at the End of the World. It's not uplifting, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, but, the, but, but the point is that that you, you've been through it with people who are in the book, and then you close the book, and, and you're like, okay, I'm not alone, and that's over. <laughs> and I close that book, and it's not, it didn't happen to me, but I, I can communicate with those people somehow, you know? Um, so when I say, like, talk about heart and hope and horror there's all of that and i do there's a whole other element of that but i just wanted to say that that even no matter what the bleakest horror is um, <laughs> i would say i totally agree like I, the heart and horror phrase you know, like this, <laughs> I might want to reading too much online, but that phrase online seems to have uh, become horror like with heart. horror with heart right. means horror is like a happy end. And also, but again, I'm all for some of those, but it, yeah. I don't want it to ever be that's all it is. Right. Yeah. And Hollywood studios, Hollywood executives who are trying to make horror because it's now popular yeah. are never, you never want to watch their movies because they don't know anything about it. So I'm going to say something bold. They have always yeah, done not this. Hillary. They have always done this. I'm pretending that it's new. Right. Is wrong. Mm -hmm. If any of you have ever seen the movie The Descent, there are two different versions of the ending of that film. And the UK version is absolutely superior in every possible way to the American one. But what happened with Americans, particularly in American test audience, and this happened with another film in the 90s, aging myself, called Stigmata, where they take the movie as is with the bleak, better ending, more satisfying, narratively speaking, not for, you know, feel good. But in both cases, they test ran it against American audiences, and American audiences wanted their happy endings, specifically. Now, if you leave us and you go elsewhere, the dissent becomes what the dissent in the UK was, because there wasn't a demand and an insistence to cater to the need for that, that happy ending. So I'm listening to this, I'm going, you know, and that's so typical. Like, it's we haven't moved on from the horror with heart narrative, at all, it's just lingering. Maybe it's also like because we it's achieved like a, a certain level of popularity again now that that. Yeah, I think I think what you're seeing it. I think they're just rehashing talking points that we've seen for 20, 30, oh god, longer years now. Yeah. So you know, uh, it's just I'm thinking about that while we're talking about it. Yeah. The demand for happiness at the end, and it seems very much an American culture. Mm -hmm. It does not seem to be something that is necessarily worldwide. I'm going to shut up, but it's just hilarious you brought that movie because my daughter and her. 
teenage friends came over the house and said, pick a scary movie for us. That's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gave them the descent uncut. A female, female empowerment yeah. narrative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was terrible. Come on. Yeah. It, 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 speaking of happy endings, like I, I really don't believe that there's, there's no such thing as a happy ending. Like, nobody gets a happy ending. You get the best outcome you're willing to work for. You know, and that's that's just how it is. Like he, even in these movies with this, you know, if it's a horror movie, <laughs> like there's a happy ending. You lost all your friends. The house gets you know, the main character has survived, but you know, and, and I know, I know what you're referring to with the descent. I, I prefer the other ending as well. But I they've know. done it with other ones. But I mean, yeah. To that point, though, Night of the Living Dead. Ben doesn't get what he worked for. <laughs> it gets killed by a bunch of overzealous white people. <laughs> <laughs> It's not happy ending. I wish I had a better, uh, more mics. Um, feel free to keep talking. This is the easiest panel I've ever moderated. <laughs> um, but I am curious about this moment of horror, horror because, as you said, um, for us people that are not as old, although I am, um, <laughs> that this was happening 30 years ago. Now it seems to be having a resurgence. And your point, Hillary, is that. It's especially important for Gen Z, but I'm feeling it as a whatever I am um, <laughs> as well. So why is it having a moment now? And I wanted to also talk about the uh, happy ending because you know romance is is huge right now, as is horror. So what's happening right now? Everything's bad. <laughs> yes. um, all right. Well, you know, I mean, I think I think Christopher in particular could speak better to trends of buying a horror on a mass market scale. But I mean, let's let's look at Clive Barker. The guy talked about the AIDS epidemic and made homosexual people and characters, gay men, um, particularly empathetic in a lot of his work in the 80s because he was doing a narrative, and a lot of his work explored narratives of, you're calling us a monster and I'm gonna write about the monsters and then you're gonna find yourself siding with the monsters. I think horror has always, always, always reflected sensibilities of the times that it is. Um, so like always, I mean, if you watch, I'm gonna go back to Night of the Living Dead. It's an, it's, it's an OG amazing movie, it's, it's, but oh my God. So at the time when this movie came out um, in the 60s, the civil rights movement was going on and what the directors of that film did not realize is that casting a black man as the lead when he was not explicitly in the film said to be a black man, as in it was not written the part with somebody in mind. And they they said, he's the best actor for this particular role. Yeah. So we're gonna cast the best actor. The willingness of the directors at the time and of the team of the time to do that is highly political mm -hmm. and also highly indicative of the pushback against the 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 you know paradigm of the time. I feel like the reason why horror right now is seeing it is it's it's a moment we are witnessing a moment we are witnessing a world a world pandemic we are witnessing lines being drawn politically you used to be able to sit next to your really uncomfortable and unfortunate uncle while he spouted <laughs> off the worst rhetoric and say pass the mashed potatoes but now if you do it you're afraid that somebody's going to listen to what he says online and go shoot somebody somewhere yeah, yeah. you have to push back against this stuff yeah. and horror has traditionally looked at what was going on politically what was going on at the time and specifically used it as an outlet to push back against problematic status quo so, uh, um that obviously and and also i horror as a a genre, especially horror fiction, not as much, I think, in horror, uh, other, in other media, but especially in horror fiction, horror has always been a genre of outsiders. Horror has always been a genre of people who feel like they don't belong or who are made to feel like they don't belong. And it's, uh, I feel like it's the, it's the, the genre that is most embracing of people who, who need, we talk about, uh, many of us go to this convention in the summertime called Nikon. And one of the things we always talk about in econ, we say like you walk in an econ and it feels like a family reunion because you feel like you belong. Uh, these are my people in a way that so many people don't feel with their own families. They don't feel with the groups that are more um, homogenous. Um, and so 
I think right now, two things are happening with her also. The people who are um, feeling like they don't belong, or whose families make them feel like they don't belong, or whose communities make them feel like they don't belong, find her as a, hopefully, usually, as a welcoming space. But also, I think that most of Gen Z all feel that because of the world that they live in right now, even if they're not uh, from a group that's traditionally been marginalized. And um, I feel like most of Gen Z feels like they're all marginalized because nobody's listening to their voices saying, hey, you're destroying the world right now and you're and, and you're just letting it happen and not thinking about it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the things I've always loved about horror. Um, uh, hopefully, um, it, with the exception of, of I think, outliers, um, everyone is welcome. When I say, well, hopefully, horror makes everybody feel welcome. And we're now also finally getting to the point where the people who don't want to make everybody feel welcome are themselves no longer welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a weird discussion for me because I do write horror with happy endings. <laughs> um, I also write horror with uh, strong romantic elements. Um, <laughs> uh, it's horror romance. I don't know. <laughs> and okay, I wasn't alive 30 years ago. <laughs> so I don't really know what's going on back then because it didn't exist. Uh, <laughs> ouch. <laughs> Um, so I don't know I feel like my view of horror is a lot different because my first book came out last year it was published in the YA space it's a very which is really different I mean I think the attitude towards horror in YA is a little bit more optimistic sometimes um, especially because you do look at how much everything has sucked supremely for Gen Z and Gen Alpha I guess is the one after them I don't know um, but it's like I don't know I think there is something to be said about telling those kids that even if there are all of these horrible, horrible things happening all the time, there is, you know, strength in being able to, you know, use what you have to win, to fight, to have a happy ending. So I think the sort of nihilistic view of horror as it has to be dark, it has to be this horrible thing where no one survives at the end is like, again, it's okay if you write that, but <laughs> that's not what I write. And I also think that it's okay to have horror with happy endings and horror with heart, and that doesn't take it away from the genre necessarily. Mm. Yeah, I just just to clarify, I also almost always have romance in my book, and usually my books do have a conditional happy ending. <laughs> um, but somebody always has it's cost them something to have the happiest at the end. That's oh all. yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, so you know, everyone's missing an arm or something by the end. <laughs> You know. <laughs> uh, can we just get it to Eric, do you want to keep it? Um, yeah. Can you just go down the line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I could, I could speak a little bit about why we're seeing like a resurgence in queer horror, if that's cool. Um, so, I mean, as I said earlier, like, you know, things are really shitty right now and they've been shitty. Um, I feel like when I was growing up, people, especially queer people, they obviously were fighting back, but I like just me personally growing up, I felt just so disenfranchised and like downtrodden and just like, you know, the world was against me. And now I feel like I'm in a place now where I'm like, you know what, fuck that. Like, I'm gonna do what I want. Like, you know, what you see is what you get and it is what it is. And I feel like we're seeing this group of writers that came up with, you know, the phrase, like, that's so gay, when we were, you know, kids, that was just, like, synonymous with anything that's, oh, that's stupid, you know? Um, so now you see people reclaiming um, queer queerness and queer horror. Um, so, I mean, like, people like Gretchen Felker Martin, who was supposed to be here, Manhunt, uh, amazing book. Um, Joe Koch, another amazing queer writer, um, Haley Piper. Um, there's just like a huge just roster of queer talent writing, um, just exceptional, like really visceral in your face queer fiction. 
And I think it's indicative of like the time that we're living in, like what you said, like, you know, we're pushing back on these societal, um, this bullshit that we're dealing with. And we're definitely not gonna stop fighting. Really quickly, it's, you know, whenever you hear the phrase, your heart is having a moment, it sort of makes me laugh because it implies it's going to end. <laughs> um, which, you know, maybe uh, maybe that should be the case. Horror should always be, as, as Chris alluded to, be the outsider or, you know, poking at the fringes of, of quote unquote mainstream society. Um, I was going to say briefly that I don't write, I have, but not a lot of romance and sex in my books because my deepest fear is to end up on one of those like bad sex writing. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it is funny, you know, I'm as much as I made fun of Chris, you know, close in age, um, you know, the idea of, oh, like the 80s were a horrible time because, you know, we grew up with the fear of nuclear war, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, what Eric alluded to before with his reading of sociopolitical history, it's always been bad. <laughs> now, granted, you know, maybe things have been heightened, or I should say maybe, but, you know, with the pandemic and everything else, but I don't know, like I always, that's the sort of like the danger of nostalgia to think, oh, these times were better for people. No, they weren't. Um, we, you know, we, so I mean, horror is always, I think the best horror, as Hillary said, reflects those times. The interesting part to me is hearing it horror discussed now is for decades, for years and years, um, it, when I was first getting interested in horror, like the discussion was, is horror an innately reactionary genre? Uh, and I think even Stephen King had some sort of essay. It might have been a dance for Cobb or somewhere else where he was talking about the idea of is horror reactionary. Um, well, you know, what I think has been sort of proven, at least, you know, in my eyes, is that the horror that stands the test of time, like, you know, The Night of the Living Dead or, you know, some of these other groundbreaking 70s films that very much fit in a progressive structure. And not even, you know, both politically, but also in terms of structure, meaning like by the end of the book, there is no restoration of the status quo. You know, by the end of your horror story, whether there's a happy ending or not, it reflects it reflects the truth that things change. Change is inevitable. Change is existence. Um, and I don't know. I just want to. I don't know what point those building towards. But that was <laughs> I think uh, uh, Brian Dean talks a lot about the different eras of horror, like and in, in why it comes and why it goes, and it's. I think that's really more along the lines of of what's um, the popularity of it, because, you know, the same people have continued writing this stuff. Um, and just because it's not being you know, marketed as well, <laughs> many, many books aren't marketed as well, um, or being adapted into things, uh, movies or television shows and stuff, it doesn't mean that it, that it ever went away. And I, I think the, the moment now, um, especially because of the diversity of people writing things you know mentioning uh, queer writers Craig Craig L. Gibney mm -hmm. is is an amazing writer he does a lot of short story work he's, he's got a few collections but he's, he's a black queer writer and those themes turn up in his work um but all of these marginalized groups are now having more, well are taking more of the opportunity they're, they're seizing more of the data to create some of these things and I, I think a lot of that is because uh, America has been on a really slow march to the truth. And I consider the truth like undeniable reality. Um, and so that has to do with not only history, but the existence of all these different people that live here. And um, I think we're seeing a, a lot of that as being re reflected best in hard because it's, you know, one of the few genres that's, that's you know, a feeling more than anything else. And it's it's a, a humans have feelings and, and these stories tap into those feelings. And being able to comprehend, to understand the differences between different groups of people and where the conflicts are and where they're not, and where we're similar, um, because everything is a huge spectrum. Um, I think horror is the is pretty much pretty much the only genre that is that is excavating violently <laughs> into those things. Really true. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? The last amount of conversation we just had. We want to follow. Okay, cool. Uh, I just one small point, which is that I've really been curious to see sales data 
um, from Florida. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is, it's become this incredible dystopia, right? And uh, although it's, you know, many, many people there are happy to have that, but I'm sure some aren't. So I wonder if horror is doing better per capita <laughs> there. I'm curious. Anybody want to Google it? <laughs> I mean, we have the library, we probably look it up. Uh, okay, so um, Eric, please keep the mic because uh, my next question is about monsters. Um, because, of course, in monstrous situations that horror does such a good job of capturing, what is the purpose of that for us as a reader? You know, the monster almost always gets defeated, right? Any, any, almost always. <laughs> um, and I think any story that features uh, something that is uh, a, you know, a fictional creature um, wreaking havoc, and it, you know, at some point, it, it, maybe it reproduces and it continues, but more often than not, it's people overcoming this particular thing. Um, and that's very satisfying. Um, it's, it is... Uh, a very abstract representation of what the truth could be. Mm. Like we can slay monsters. We can. It's not impossible. And, you know, uh, whenever whatever you read, fiction is 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 in a lot of ways empowering. Everybody here talks about how good they feel when they read this stuff or when they write this stuff. But yeah, um, they're also really super cool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, coming up with really interesting and weird monsters, whether they're based on um, mythology or not, uh, especially interweaving it with our modern understanding of so many different things now, um, it's just a pleasure, like it's a raw pleasure. But also keep in mind that the worst monsters are us, mm -hmm. you know, so our stories that feature a monster that is a person to me, are the most terrifying and difficult mm -hmm. to read. Because those could actually happen. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah absolutely. I mean, that's a great answer. I don't have too much more to add. I mean, just whenever you bring monster, I mean, that makes me think too when I was a kid because that was sort of my gateway to horror. Like, you know, for any locals of a certain age, creature double feature was sort of what, mm -hmm. you know, brought me there. You know, because as a kid, it's like monsters are cool. I mean, they're scary, but like, you know, you think, oh, wouldn't that be cool if they existed, <laughs> even though they're killing people? Um, you know, so then, like, I think a lot of horror fans start off that way. It's just like the sort of the sort of the fun horror possibility, right? That this 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 could happen and that it could be overcome. And then you hit a certain age, and for me, it was you know nuclear war nightmares and oh, the factory my father's worked at for twenty five years is laying everybody off. Like those real life fears start to mix, you know, because the stories I want to tell are more like the latter. But, you know, there's still that part of me that wants to sort of weave in, you know, the little bit of the fun of, of the monster, too. So it's, you know, that weird attraction, that push and pull of horror. Again, the idea that um, you don't feel safe, but it's okay because other people don't feel safe, too. I think, um, you know, I'm not a huge monster person. Like, my favorite monster is just, like, human beings because we're just so awful to one another. And a lot of my books are just... <laughs> people doing terrible things to one another um, that's true yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's true um but i would say like a um a piece of you know fiction and film that does like that works for me on a really visceral level with regard to the monster is uh clive barker's nightbreed um because you have a situation where you end up really identifying with the monsters in in the piece um and uh you know they're obvious at least in my interpretation they're coded um with regard to the queerness and, and the sexuality but um yeah i i think the monster i think it's an, an an important aspect of horror um but i i don't i guess i don't really have anything more to add to that really <laughs> That was an excellent answer, though. <laughs> um, monsters are my jam. Yeah. I love monsters. Um, and I think it's it's like you were saying, Eric, um, a lot of the time with monsters, they they tend to be a metaphor, right? There's A monster is rarely a monster. They're usually something else. Um, and for a really long time, monsters were people of color. They were queer people. They were women, you know? <laughs> Um, but 
So one of the things that I did with my first book was it is cosmic horror, which was sort of originated with Lovecraft, who sucks supremely. Um, and, in, and a, you know, a lot of his stuff was demonizing marginalized communities. And so I wanted to flip it that my Lovecraftian horror eldritch creature was very much like straight cishet people <laughs> and that the queer leads were going up against um, because I wanted to sort of flip that classic, you know, monsters or marginalized people on its head and make marginalized people the heroes instead. Um, and then in my second book, I decided to kind of uh, reverse it again, where I was like, okay, all of these people are flesh eating ghouls, um, but they're also good people when you get past the cannibalism. <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, <laughs> it's very much my dialogue with myself of like, is being a monster something that is empowering? Is that something that like, you know, if society views me as a monster, why not just lean into it sort of um, and be what they're so afraid of, um, but at the same time humanize those monsters to say like, yes, this is a creature with claws and sharp teeth and so on and so forth, but also it has a full emotional range and, and love. <laughs> And so I find that using the monster metaphor is so fun to play with, especially when you are writing um, with, you know, marginalized communities in mind. Um, and also, I just think it's so fun to, like, over-describe a monster. I'm, like, starting at the top of the monster, and I'm like, all right, so here's the head, and just, like, working my way all the way down. Super fun. So, like, huge fan. Since there are romances, too, I'm kind of interested in that. <laughs> It sounded to me like you were describing Grendel, you know, like halfway through that. Like that's like the first. I have a monster in my story. Somebody's making out with it. <laughs> so that's where I'm hanging on the monster scale. Uh, I like I like the monsters and metaphors thing uh, because absolutely. I mean, all right, y'all, y'all ever looked at a face hugger? <laughs> say anything more about them. <laughs> um, they are concepts and my favorite monsters I mean, you know don't, don't get me wrong I love me a big kaiju you know that's that's like me on a Monday but um I I love I love the big obvious ones but the ones that I like are the ones that that are there to make us look at ourselves they are there to, and this is why this is why I make out with my monsters <laughs> but I love monsters that are serving the purpose of of reflection of who really is the monster here you know and and that's very much going into what Kayla said here and, and I love that um that to me is fascinating but even in a book where I have a ghost a monster a ghoulie or whatever it is never there just for it, it's it's always got a story it's always got a reason and that reason is supposed to make you think you know, in Mary, which is out there, and, you know, Bloody Mary has a backstory. She is not just arbitrarily hunting people. Uh, I mean, she she kind of does it for sport, but, you know, <laughs> but no, I mean, she literally, I love monsters because monsters that make us look at ourselves, make us position ourselves against an idea that we have embodied into something with tentacles, fangs, eyeballs, and, you know, that's blowing smoke out of its butt, whatever. Those, that they if they make us reflect on what we're doing, how we're interacting with the world, how we're interacting with, with concepts, yeah, I, I, I love that. I freaking love monsters. And um, I don't write nearly enough of them. You should write monsters for me. <laughs> I should write monsters for Molly. As far as, um, you know, cannibalism uh, amongst nice people. <laughs> All I'm going to say is, you know, a woman's got to eat. So there's not... You know, um, years ago I did an anthology called uh, Monsters Corner that had the subtitle Stories Through Inhuman Eyes. Um, and the whole anthology was short stories by various writers taking the side of, of the monster because um, every monster has a point of view uh, and, uh, and every monster thinks that they're the hero of their own story just like the rest of us. Uh, so I always, I... I think it was Eric, I'm not sure, uh, who said, uh, I'm talking about the difference. So 15-year-old me, even younger me, you know, kaiju, creature feature, uh, Paul talked about creature feature, uh, you know, giant monsters. I still love, you know, give me underwater with Kristen Stewart. 
um, uh, and I will be happy for weeks. Uh, you know, he looks, yeah, really. Uh, she seeing that movie is like everybody. I can't if you don't react to her in that movie anyway. Um, but that's sports for us doing the work of God. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, so so do I love those monsters? Absolutely, I love those monsters. And that the kid in me is always going to love Pacific Rim and, and all that kind of stuff. Great. Um, but the, the grown-up in me, especially writing, I write both kinds of monsters, also um, just loves this question of what is monstrosity. And I think we face that question every single day. I mentioned uh, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> I mean, you know, Ron DeSantis thinks that probably most of the people, and if you're a fan of Ron DeSantis, you're a monster. And and if you're if you're sitting here quietly, if you're sitting here quietly offended by that, I'm not sorry. So, but my point is like Ron DeSantis. If you don't think that he's great, if you agree with me on this subject, he thinks that you're a monster. And so we talk about monstrosity and people who think they're right. Um, and again, it's could we come up with like, you know, uh, JK Rowling thinks trans women are monsters. Uh, and anybody with a brain is like, um, I think the monstrosity here is is not trans women. And, and it's, I just don't, um, I think that, the conversation about what makes monstrous, monstrousness, monstrosity um, outside of horror is probably the most valuable conversation we can have in uh, in world discourse today, literally. What is monstrosity? Um, because it's a battle that we are fighting every single day, especially in this country right now. Um, and, 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 and narrative, uh, control of the narrative. If you look at... Uh, and again, I'm sorry to take it here, but I'm going to. I'm not sorry. I'm lying about that. Um, my father-in-law is 96 years old, and he doesn't he can't make that anything anyway. But I go into the house, and he's got Fox News on. And we're talking about narrative. And to me, you're sitting there watching what's happening in Ukraine. And they keep trying to change the narrative of what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine is a country that was invaded by another country. So to me, if you have invaded a country, uh, that makes you the aggressor. I think that's pretty patently if we look at definitions of things. If you are in the invader, the would-be conqueror, you are the aggressor. Uh, so therefore, your behavior is the monstrous behavior. But if you watch Fox News, and I'm just using this as an example, um, they're telling you the opposite. They're telling you Russia is not the aggressor. They're doing what they have to do. They're doing, you know, and so... When we write about monstrousness, um, that's the question we keep asking, right? The things we keep exploring is what makes monstrosity. Um, and so I just find that fascinating. On the other hand, uh, I do like me a good sexy monster. Um, and, and I also think that, um, I think Game of Thrones is partially to blame for all the sex toys and shape of monster. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know Sasquatch. I mean, I won't even go another yeah. some children in the room, so I don't want to go. Back to me after you and Sasquatch. That's okay. Um, so we're actually just about out of time, and as I promised, you are not going to get time to ask questions. Um, but I would like to ask really quickly: What is your absolute favorite thing about writing horror, Hillary? I like this and people off. I do. I, I, you know, I, I like talking about what I, I love talking about horror. I love it. Like just beyond a panel, you want to stop me in the hall and you want to talk to me about horror movies. I'm there. Like we'll have a TED talk right on the spot. Let's go. <laughs> and I like talking about the things that get the emotional rise out of you. And I think horror is a great way. I don't, I believe it might've been Eric or I'm, I'm not sure which Eric, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but one of them said that it's, it's about the emotional connection. And that's absolutely true about horror. What do I love about horror? I love, I love the emotions that it evokes and the way that that spans, you know, the distance between people. I think that's fantastic. Nice. Yeah. And if you want to keep a lot of people off, no, we got our... Thank you, Taylor.
Are you sure? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Oh, it's mine now. It's yours now. <laughs> um, no, I love writing about gore. I've spent a lot of time being like, my books are happy and have great endings. I mean, I also love to write about like ripping teeth out and like <laughs> someone's, you know, we're eating viscera. It's, you know, I think there's just something really fun about describing really nasty gore yeah. that's really cathartic for me. Like there's nothing <laughs> deep and cool about it. I just think I'm like, oh, cool. Let's like gut somebody. <laughs> like, I really look forward to that because I'm a twisted freak. <laughs> and so like, that's really big. And also, you know, all of the societal confrontation and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but mostly the gut ribbon that really does something for me. I feel like you need to write a song about that. In the viscera. <laughs> um, horror makes me like writing horror makes me feel powerful in a lot of ways. You know. Um. Lady Gaga said that they can't scare me if I scare them first. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm scaring you before you can do anything to me, you know? Um, and uh, writing just, writing horror just feels so cathartic and, uh, you know, release of trauma and anxiety, depression, all of that fun stuff. Uh, but it just makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel like I have the upper hand and, you know, I'm fighting back against all the bullshit. That's it. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, why do I like writing horror, right? I hate writing. <laughs> no, like, I hate myself. I hate the story. Part I'm addicted to is when I have like a full draft of a novel or a yeah. full draft of a story because, and then when I read it, like I read, I mean, I write for myself first and foremost. Like I, I try to write the stories that I want out in the world. And, and if I feel good enough about the job that I did, I feel like this thing that I wrote represents the best parts of me, uh, you know, that I often fall short of. But there's this book that represents all the things that, you know, I wish I could be or, or, or I aim to be. Wow. I know exactly what you're talking about. The, I, I got the same sensation of like doing fight training and you're just blasting away for an hour, hour and a half, doing all these stupid exercises, attacking each other. And at the, you know, at the end of two or three hours of this, you know, the head sensor, oh yeah, wasn't that great? God, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst possible thing you could today. Glad it's over. <laughs> you know, it's something that was done right so you know you've written a great volume of words when you're finished very satisfying when we finish this look at this um i like writing this stuff because i get to put people that i grew up with that i know and i never got to see in stories and like I, you know I, I grew up in like a 100% black neighborhood, you know, and there was none of those elements were ever in the things that I enjoyed, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot of what's happening now. We're just There's just been this resurgence in uh, really fantastic fiction because it's coming from so many different corners. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in that inserting of the, you know, culture yeah. that I understand and the way that I understand it and into these things that I enjoy. I thought you were going to say that you took the people that you knew and have them <laughs> <by> <laughs> I kill them by name. They know who they are. But I will say, you know, just sort of that, you know, related story. So my first novel, um, when I was shopping it around um, to various publishers, I would get some really strange comments because the main character is, he's black. Um, most of his allies are non-white and the, the four bad guys in the first book or why? <laughs> so, you know, it's like, why, why are all the bad people? Right? <laughs> it's like, why, why are they the villains? And I'm like, aren't they always? They're not even trying to say anything here. Like, it's, it's, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very mean. And a lot's changed because that was 2013, 2012. Like, that question never comes up anymore. 
Interesting. So Christopher, would you like to have the last word on this? No. Doesn't he always? <laughs> Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I I wasn't going to. I think I think I, I think I've made my answer to that question here. I wasn't going to, um, but I will say uh, um, on a non-funny note, in response to what you just said, Eric, the one thing I did have recently, and I I railed against it, is I had a copy editor who um, who came back with the question. They tried to when I identified characters in a in a book of mine as white in describing them, um, the copy editor pushed back and tried to take it out to like, this is not necessary. And I yeah. told the editor, that I said, I absolutely insist you put this in. Because again, so this copy editor is trying to give us the defaultness of whiteness, so the default of whiteness. And it was like, I'm, I'm saying that these characters are white because uh, I also point out when characters are not white and, uh, and so yeah, so it it's happening in mainstream fiction right now still that default whiteness and you just have to push anyway. Yeah, well, well, um, I wish we had done had time for the outtakes and bloopers, but um, <laughs> maybe during your discussion uh, sessions, uh, the schedule is posted upstairs. Thank you guys so much for this really amazing panel discussion of very important topics as well as being very funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So for everybody here, thank you so much. The authors are going to be at their tables. Um, signing books. You can both buy books from Aesop's Fables in the meantime. And I'm going to just ask if you, the authors yeah. go ahead up to your tables first. And Sorry. So are, I thought we were doing the small groups next. No, no, uh, we have half an hour of uh, signing. Oh, signing. Then small you're... groups, yeah. then sign. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Hillary yeah. memorized yeah. the schedule. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so authors go out first. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>